Hello everyone, it's me, the Boss Hog. We're back after a few weeks away, mainly because I was snowed under at work. But I was originally going to be planning to talk about Amcor and Huntsman, but instead we find ourselves talking about US banks and Genius Sports, as well as UK insurers. Let's do it. All right, so in terms of this week, I want to start with an apology for a lack of videos over the last few weeks. Uh, honestly, I've just been completely rammed at work. Uh, my company is putting in a new billing system and a new payment system, which is literally both of my areas, basically. Uh, so I've just been having to do a ton of testing and feedback and, and you know, how these big projects go. So I haven't been able to find the time, frankly. Uh, on top of that, any time that I would have liked to have spent on these type of videos was kind of taken up by my wife being ill, which is uh, sod's law in essence. So uh, apologies all the same. It is definitely an aim for me this year to make more videos. So we'll try and get back into a more regular cycle moving forward. I wanted to start with Silicon Valley Bank because as you'll see from maybe the thumbnail or what we're going to be talking about next, I don't really view it as a systemic issue. And to be honest with you, I kind of view it as just a massive failure of risk. Um, the bank made a mistake, a, a very big one. In many ways, it was quite a successful bank. You know, deposits were growing. It was growing. Market cap was growing. You know, it, it has a lot of sort of ticks in the front door. Um, but obviously, unless you're able to turn those things like deposits into um, generating assets, then it's going to be a problem. And effectively, they went long dated, um, you know, bonds at more or less the worst time and then had problems as a result. Right. And then you get the bank run as well. So suddenly all the deposits start being start going missing and yeah it's a pretty ugly uh, situation but I, I view this really as a singular issue where a company and the company's risk structure basically messed up i mean to be clear right a lot of their long-term bonds were between four and ten years which compared to something like life assurance um is quite a, not really a very long period of time right and these companies are able to manage just fine so uh, yeah i looked into it it's uh, a mess obviously and i mean the company is uh, delisted for a, an obvious reason and we hope that somebody will uh, arrange a packaged sort of you know 10 cents on the dollar kind of buyout because i think that's basically what will be needed in order to stem it yeah so uh, to me I, I spent a couple of hours actually on friday looking into this i also have a regional bank uh, huntington bank share so i wanted to make sure again that it wasn't sort of some wider issue obviously when you're investing in regionals it matters a lot uh, you know it's higher risk higher reward and although i decided not to make any movements or any sales basically on huntington i may well revisit that in the future especially if i continue to uh, buy the the bank's etf that we're going to be talking about soon so uh, it does sort of remind me a little bit of not jumping ship, maybe when I could have done with Everaz, a very different situation, of course. Um, but I'm keen to sort of stop that from happening. So the more I thought about it, like, although I don't think HBAN is affected, it did kind of bring home to me the uh, the situation with regionals, right? Like, so is, is, is it worth maybe selling out of HBAN 20% under what I think it's worth in order to preserve the capital? Probably, um, because, you know, that capital over the next 20 years will treble. Uh, probably more like quadruple. So it's just a case of uh, putting those things into context, really. I also wanted to just talk about being pleasantly surprised by UK GDP. Um, this is obviously uh, a good thing that it was such a beat, basically, in the last quarter. Um, a lot of the sort of IMFs, as well as uh, UK bodies, expect the UK to basically have like a four to five quarter recession. Uh, so this was quite the surprise. It basically means that we need at least two more quarters before we have a technical recession. It's not exactly all great because it you know, shows that the UK economy is more or less stagnating. Uh, so there's definitely not a, a particularly healthy economy there. Uh, the hope is that this will be something to build on and basically everyone's been too pessimistic. I do always observe that UK sort of surveys when they're sort of, you know, manufacturer surveys or those kind of things, they are always pessimistic. Uh, I don't know, maybe it's something to do with our culture and uh, the people in the UK just being naturally pessimistic uh, in their outlook. I I'm not sure. Um, but it was a pleasant surprise, basically. We'll see how that looks. I mean, the UK is still the only major uh, economy that hasn't recovered to its pre-COVID levels. Some of that is undoubtedly the fact we are service heavy as, a, as an economy. I would also suggest it hasn't been especially well managed in several ways uh, without really wanting to get political in this video. Um, so yeah, so we'll, we'll basically see what happens as a result of this. It is definitely nice, I think, to have some stability in the UK politics again after a couple of years of being all over the place, which I'm pretty sure has also dragged uh, this down as well. So maybe a bit of stability is a good thing and it's kind of being responded to with the UK GDP numbers. 
And the fourth point here I just wanted to talk about was uh, UK insurers. So I've spoken about the fact before that I think US banks are the place to go, but UK insurers are the place to go. Uh, two of the big three, I would say. Uh, there is also M&G, but they're more like a, an asset manager than an insurer. So for me, the big three um, insurers are Legal and General, Aviva and Phoenix. Uh, these are all FTSE 100, uh, big, well-established, and in most cases, very old uh, companies. Aviva especially is like four centuries old. Uh, so, you know, they've been around for a long time. Um, now, for me, I I, um, I thought both of the results that were published last week were really good. Phoenix is being published on Monday, unfortunately. It's like a, a week behind, uh, but I'll review them because that's my largest insurance holding. Um, for me, though, if I look at legal in general to start with, which is about 2% of my portfolio, I thought, again, it was really solid. I've made the argument before that if you were to pick one company in the FTSE 100 and need to hold it for 10 years, legal in general should be in that conversation. It's incredibly broad. Uh, I would point out the fact that 23% of its revenue is now coming from outside of the UK, and that's increasing quite rapidly, actually. Return on capital employed uh, breached to 20%, so really impressive. It also has a solvency cover of 236%, which again is just incredible, really. Uh, and despite everything, it's still paying a dividend of 7.3%. To me, the share price just looks really undervalued. Um, if I was maybe being a bit critical, I would like to see a buyback announcement from Legal in general, just to kind of put it onto analyst radar. Um, a lot of the analyst upgrades have, you know, like 300 Ps uh, as their target plus. Myself also, I have like a 320 to 330. So at the moment, it looks like a bit of a steal for me, especially with that nice dividend as well. Um, yeah, I mean, their capitals division was predictably poor, which is where, you know, they basically have the asset management, but still the inflows were just massive, basically rising 40% uh, year on year. Uh, there's also some concern about the fact the CEO is retiring, basically an industry stalwart, uh, well respected, and during his tenure the shares are up 600%, uh, so obviously a, a great achievement for him and for legal in general. But to me it's just such a superb, well run, well diversified company that I don't really have any major concerns about that. I would expect there to be succession planning. This is a real marquee position as well in the insurance sector, so I think it would be very attractive for a CEO to come in and uh, you know, want to work, work here. So I expect that they'll have a good pool of candidates. So yeah, I, overall, I just thought it was great. If you like legal in general before, there was very little that you would find particularly problematic here. Like I say, a lot of the divisions were good and they have a very like a good flywheel, basically. You know, they sort of, they have very sticky customers because they're so diverse. And, you know, once they get money in one place, they can basically reinvest it very nicely, which I do appreciate is sort of a way that insurers make money. But they're just particularly good at sort of bridging that gap between um, the, the pension inflows and then the investments as well. So I, th I just think it's really good uh, from that perspective. Uh, Aviva was arguably even better, although it was more or less in line with Aviva's expectations. Still, though, the share price reacted positively, so I think it was ahead of market expectations. I sold out of Aviva about um, a year ago now because I considered the turnaround complete. All that this announcement really did was kind of solidify that fact. So although the dividend was up almost 50% year on year, that's expected to be the last uh, big jump in their dividend. And likewise, a 300 million buyback was more or less in line with expectations. It takes their three year uh, return to shareholders to over 5 billion. It's also interesting that they did have an activist investor over the last couple of years who took a meaningful um, position in the company and they've basically sold their position down under 5%. So basically not enough to justify a board seat any longer. And they were very positive. They, they sort of got everything that they wanted, a kind of 5 billion uh, capital return. And yeah, I just, and you know, we're very complimentary basically around the fact that Aviva <clears throat> is basically delivered shareholder value in completely the opposite way to legal in general. So whereas legal in general is kind of growing internationally, diversifying, Aviva's basically stripped itself back to the basics. And as a result of that, it's just a much simpler and better business, basically. Profits up 35% year on year. So again, it kind of shows you that you don't need uh, necessarily bigger is better uh, when you're delivering shareholder returns in this way. So I thought that was uh, very good. Um, I'd also highlight here that their UK life business uh, was really strong, um, which potentially for me is a very large holder of Phoenix is a good thing uh, because Phoenix is even more exaggerated in that particular sector. So the, to me, I, I view both of these results as good. I do sort of expect legal in general to be very good, although I was impressed that their return on capital was above 20%. I think that's definitely one of the big uh, standouts for me. Uh, and likewise as well to me, I, I like I say, I consider Aviva's turnaround basically complete. I think a lot of credit should go to the management and, and their CEO. 
Um, <clears throat> so yeah, we'll, we'll basically see. I mean, I would say that Legal in general, Aviva and Phoenix all have really great CEOs and Phoenix, especially who I follow more closely, has a great CFO as well. So, you know, things like the appropriation of risk, I, I'm very confident in Phoenix's hedging uh, and won't be a repeat of something like Silicon Valley, right? Uh, so I just thought both of these really good. I consider both shares, especially legal in general, undervalued. I think, like I said, Aviva, a lot of the upside is now baked in, the turnaround delivered, uh, and you have a simpler, better business as a result. Uh, but don't be going into this expecting 50% dividend increases uh, into the future. It's now a much more stable business than it has been. And likewise as well, though, there I do expect there to be improvements in their sort of buybacks and dividends uh, it's not going to be anywhere near these kind of volumes so just you know, like i say if you're into aviva just do it for the right reasons it's no longer a turnaround play it's a mature sensibly run nimble i guess reference 100 uh, insurance company so i just wanted to touch on that because like i say I i'm bullish and actually one or two of my subscribers as well have asked me to talk about legal in general specifically a bit more uh, as well as aviva and like i say i consider legal in general aviva and phoenix as the big three insurers uh, excluding mng because i think it's more of an asset manager so I just wanted to talk through that. Let's have a look at my portfolio now and how that's doing. OK, so in terms of my portfolio here, um, you can see that for the week ending the 10th of March, we are back down to a portfolio value of 125K. Profits actually significantly reduced from, you know, 18,000 just a few weeks ago down to 4,000. So we are still in the green, but definitely a significant pullback uh, compared to where we were, which was at the time an all time profit high. We continue, though, to basically trust the process, uh, keep on averaging in, et cetera, et cetera. I'm very close to filling up <clears throat> both of our ISAs this year. So our um, investment accounts, basically me and my wife, uh, got just under 3K to add, which we'll be doing at the end of March when we get paid. So again, we, we continue just to add to this and um, average into various positions. So I wanted to start here just because it's been a couple of weeks and you can kind of see the general direction. If I go up a little bit to show you the graphs, um, by the way, because I'm doing this on a Sunday instead of a Saturday, some of the currency markets are already uh, doing things. So hence why this is a plus 15 so far. And so we, we can ignore that for now and basically take that 15 off of that figure. So this is our breakdown as it looks. <clears throat> you can see if I look at some graphs here that the uh, you know our overall portfolio value, again, this was above 130, had a significant dip on Friday uh, in particular. Also as well, in terms of our time weighted performance, we are back underneath the FTSE 350. Again, it continues to outperform quite markedly. Um, but I've definitely not been performing as well as even the S&P 500 in March. Uh, I, I'm very heavily uh, exposed to tech as well as increasingly exposed to financials, where, to be honest with you, I like both sectors. So, again, I'm just trying to be brave and, uh, you know, ride out any variants. And for me, again, this is my original aim with doing this was to see how I performed over a three year period. That was my original aim. If I'm honest, in hindsight, I think I should have made that five years because I don't think three years is long enough to to really measure especially in a really weird market over the last three years um but broadly speaking i'm still happy with the fact that i'm a new investor i'm quite comfortably beating the s p as well as the all world and even though i'm behind the FTSE 350 i think there are good reasons for that and the FTSE 350 has basically outperformed everything the FTSE 100 is basically carrying that because it's a very defensive index so uh, again it's a bit sad i'm no longer on top of all of my comparisons but i remain reasonably confident uh, in the long run in terms of my portfolio over time, again, I'm really hoping that this is going to um, be a, a fantastic thing to look at in 10 to 20 years when there'll be a huge chunk of blue and pink is my hope. Uh, but you can see here basically that now I'm only profitable thanks to uh, the dividend. I'm basically, if you were to look at my growth here, we're in the minuses again. So in terms of purely capital, but then our dividend of 5.6K basically carries us over. So divvy minus growth is basically our net profit, right? Uh, similar as well, you can see on this graph, again, all time high just a few weeks ago up here in terms of our profit. Uh, even the UK was back to black uh, after my sort of relative disaster with the Russian miners over here. Uh, but yeah, significant pullback on Friday. It'll be interesting to see what happens next week. And uh, it was, uh, I mean, rough, but actually, again, uh, I feel like 2022 really toughened me up a little bit. So uh, that's been good from that perspective, because I've definitely been handling the swings a lot better. Now, originally, I plan to make a video this week looking at a couple of my bigger stocks who have published results. So Amcor's results historically were pretty good, actually, I would say, for last year. But they gave really weak forward guidance for Q1. Amcor only guide one quarter in advance because they say their business just doesn't facilitate uh, long term predictions, which I kind of agree with. As a result of that, their predictions are usually pretty accurate. They, they sort of give a fairly narrow range and they'll be more or less in the middle of it. Um, so, yeah, that, that's basically it. The semiconductor space is definitely under pressure at the moment. 
and for Amcor, for Huntsman, who also had some really interesting results because they divested their smallest division, but still a material amount of their revenue. So that's an interesting one as well. Um, and yeah, there, there's been some interesting um, earnings updates from that perspective. But instead, following Friday, when both Genius published results, which we'll look at in detail uh, after we've done this portfolio review, as well as the banking situation, it just seemed to change the nature of the, the video. So I still do plan on talking about, you know, Amcor and um, Huntsman. But for now, we're going to sort of focus on Genius and other parts of my portfolio. Games Workshop, obviously here a big reduction. And I sold about half of my position at £93, 92.85. So actually at the moment, that looks like quite a timely sale. Um, that was really just to take advantage of our, uh, some tax changes. Um, but it, it was fortuitous i guess because that locked in about a 500 pound profit that i wouldn't have had otherwise so that's nice from that perspective uh in terms of other updates i mainly want to talk about my position in banks the this is a us uh, banks etf i did have a hundred pounds in it beforehand but for me i significantly expanded it to basically take my position to 2.1k you can see here i'm actually up <laughs> so that's a nice I, I timed it very well on friday obviously i don't know what's going to happen on monday um we will see but but yeah I'm, I'm pleased with how i reacted basically because like i said i spent a couple of hours on friday looking at both um silicon valley as well as huntington i'm reasonably confident it's not a systemic issue and it's like i say a misappropriation of risk at silicon valley and so for me i wanted to make a move in hindsight i kind of wish i'd done more but actually at the same time it is always quite scary buying into a falling market and you know i've definitely had situations where i bought in too early and things just kept on crashing so uh, I guess I'm quite pleased with my kind of management of risk. Also, as well, with this sizing, I can potentially add, you know, another thousand into it if I, if the risk tolerance takes me. But I think what I've decided is that if I decide to add to my bank's position, I'm going to sell down my H-band position. So I'm going to sort of keep my overall exposure to primarily regionals. Uh, again, this is a two thirds regional ETF. The way it's weighted is basically one third on the big four and then two thirds on the, the rest of the regionals. So um, our h ban is in this ETF as well, but it's down at like 12. So yeah, not a, not a particular heavy overlap and I don't have any other US banks. So this is <clears throat> going to basically be my main exposure to US banks, which I think is good to have. And we'll just continue to buy in. But it, it, if I make a big move over the next few weeks, it's going to be at the expense of HBAN, basically. So I'll sell HBAN and put it into this instead as a result. That's really the plan here. In terms of where I did get this money from, because I didn't add any capital last week specifically, I basically trimmed some existing ETFs, more or less at a net um, break even, technically up about eight pounds overall. But yeah, all of the ETFs are kind of newish to me and so I haven't moved a ton. So I sold out of uh, £500 in um, clean energy. This was slightly down, so I basically realised a small loss of £18 on the things that I sold. I actually put it into SMT, uh, so Scottish Mortgage Investment Trust, which is basically um, a growth technology ETF is probably a fair way to describe it. It's more of a fund, really, than an ETF, to be fair. And the interesting thing with this is they have 30% of their holdings in private companies. So for me, it's a great way to invest in private companies because i always don't have a way of doing so and again this is a long-term performer and for me a long-term hold i'm actually really happy with my um with my average on smt which is now in the 780 pences uh you can see here and i can find smt uh there it is <clears throat> you can see here that i'm still down like about 12 percent on my position but again i have a, i think i have a really great average and i'm really confident and i increasingly like their sort of top 20 positions as well asml especially is now their number two uh, and they have a, a number of good uh things as well so beforehand they were a bit more reliant on sort of one or two very large holdings that's gradually being spread a little bit better so i like that um then in terms of where i got the money from banks from i basically sold uh, at a profit some uh, digital security etf again this is um, an etf that i want exposure to because i think digital security is going to matter but i don't know the first thing about it but i decided to realize a small profit and similarly to automation and robotics again a very small profit here so overall i basically sold enough to justify buying two grand in banks and that was my main move over the last couple of uh well over the last week specifically so that's been my approach there if i just scroll down in terms of my uh, sectors etc so you can see here especially pre-etf technology is 32 percent but then when i break out the etf you can see my technology slice rises to 41 percent. so definitely very high on the technology um i'm kind of keeping an eye on that to work out if it is too high 
Oh, you can see here that I've still got live data, hence why that's just refreshed. Let's see if I can pull it back. Oh, don't do that to me, Google. Fuck, come on. Okay, so in terms of my portfolio, I wanted to start with my weekly closing figures. This is something I've been doing now for 10 weeks, so we have good uh, comparison and run rate. You can see that my portfolio value in trading 212, my brokerage is uh, sitting at 125K, significantly down from early February where it reached a peak. And also in the same week, that was my peak profit as well of 18K. You can see since then my profit now at 4K is significantly reduced. Uh, again, that's been a difficult this week, but it's generally been trading down anyway. I don't think I'll be alone in that to be clear, but it's uh, pretty rough to see that wiped out. At the same time though, I'm kind of uh, mischievously excited that because I'm still in the buying phase of my investment journey that now I'm gonna be able to buy things for cheaper than I would have done anyway. So I'm trying to keep it into perspective basically, but yeah, it's, it's difficult to see that kind of go down that quickly, but I wanted to start with it anyway. Um, and again, just talk about it a little bit. In terms of my week on week change, this is £15 just because I'm doing this on a Sunday. So some of the currency markets are already sort of open and therefore I, I get the movements off FX in real time. So uh, that's why that is £15 higher than what you're seeing um, on my thumbnail. In terms of portfolio value, significant dip on Friday primarily and also my time weighted performance against my benchmarks. Uh, in January, I managed to get ahead for the first time pretty much ever. I think since about October 20. 21 was where I just about here had a smidge uh, that was mainly to do with Huntsman um, activist investor that I had a big stake in at the time uh, but you can see here on I had a particularly good January but now I'm underperforming my benchmarks in March to date <clears throat> so been pulled back a little bit this is my most important measure basically this was originally meant to be a two to three year um, time horizon so that I could compare my performance to my benchmarks in fairness, it's more like a more of a five year timeline now when I look at it, because I think it's uh, you need a bit longer than two to three years. But the important thing here is that I'm not basically underperforming my benchmarks and I'm relatively happy with this. Uh, obviously, I wish I was still ahead of the FTSE 350, but with such a tech heavy portfolio, the S&P for me is my more important measure. And again, I think the FTSE 350 carried by the FTSE 100 has just outperformed everything because it's so defensive in nature and it continues to be an outperformer. Um, that I expect to continue whilst there is negativity and volatility and basically worries uh, globally about various things. So uh, again, I'm still relatively happy. Obviously, I wish I was ahead of the FTSE 350 again, but we're okay with that. In terms of this graph, which I expect to be the more important graph over sort of 10 to 20 years, um, where I hope that the blue and the pink sections will just become huge and I will be able to take real pride in that, basically. Um, you can see here that I'm now only profitable because of my um, dividend. My growth actually is minus 1200 and then my dividend here, if I can click on it, is 5.6K. So basically positive 5.6 minus the, it's quite hard to select on it, there we go, minus the 1.2 is my overall profit. So again, we're, we're kind of underwater here in terms of the, the blue, which is what happened here as well during 2022. Likewise, profit over time, you can see here my all time high of 18K in February. But since then, and especially on Friday, it's been uh, dropping downwards. Again, we try to sort of look at this um, coldly and rationally as an opportunity to buy. But of course, no one ever likes seeing their graphs go down. So I just try to kind of manage that as best as I can. Oops. Uh, in terms of my portfolio, um, originally, I expected this week to be talking about Amcor and Huntsman. Uh, they both published results that were not well received. Um, so they've been on a little bit of a negative pullback. You can see here, by the way, look at all these minuses. Um, this is just week on week change as well. So significant minuses, including on my larger positions. And then in my middle positions here, really negative. Um, in terms of my buying though, as you saw from my thumbnail, I made a significant move into the ETF banks. This is a US banks uh, ETF. It's about one third, two thirds split between the big four majors and then two thirds for the regionals. HBAN is in this as well, which is my regional of play. But it's relatively small. It's like 12th largest in the portfolio. Um, so a very little overlap, really. But I did decide that uh, after looking at Silicon Valley that I wouldn't sell HBAN immediately. I still remain green on the position, but I had been up like 20 percent uh, and now I'm up like five. So, uh, yeah, significant pullback. Basically, all of the regionals got absolutely hammered. I am considering my situation with HBAN because even though I think it's very different to Silicon Valley, I have sort of... Um, very bad memories of not jumping out of Evraz uh, as soon as I could have basically and preserving my capital. So I'm sort of weighing up the possibility of sort of putting my money into US banks as an ETF 
to minimize that risk a little bit. So for now, I'm kind of happy with my exposure here, but I think what I may well end up doing, especially if there's another buying opportunity, is selling down my H-Man position and buying more of the US Bank's ETF. I think that's going to be the the general approach here just to spread that risk a little bit so again uh, from my perspective i'd almost rather take the acceptance that hban is probably 30 percent undervalued now with the opposite side of preserving my capital and taking a small profit um rather than losing my capital basically which is again what happened to everett so i'm sort of weighing that up but as i'm sure everyone is right that's how the market kind of crashes because everyone makes a very similar kind of rationale so i'm trying to be brave uh, but at the same time, it's like, am I just being brave? I'm almost being stubborn. Uh, so that's definitely something that I'm thinking about at the moment. So I didn't sell any H-Band yet, but I may well do. Uh, but I did buy, yeah, two grand's worth of uh, US Bank's ETF. And to be honest with you, I timed it super well. So my average here is 467. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm already actually up on my position a couple of percent, which feels great. But I kind of hope to get more of a buying opportunity here because I'm really happy with my average. So we'll see. I did also sell a little bit in my uh, clean energy ETF. I was fractionally red, so I realized a loss here of 18 pounds, but I decided to put this into SMT. So sorry, Scottish Morgan Investment Trust, which is my growth uh, tech. And it was just an opportunity to buy basically. Again, it was similarly impacted by the assumption that everything would be suffering. Um, and again, this invests in sort of very small companies as well as big ones. Um, so 30% of its portfolio is in private companies so the assumption is is that you know some of those will be impacted as well but broadly speaking i like the long-term direction of smt in order for my 2k financing of banks i sold uh, a significant amount of uh, iShares digital security as well as the automation and robotics both of these were fractionally green so my overall realized profit was about nine pounds once i net those free trades off but more or less you know immaterial uh, and it was really just about, again, buying into the bank's ETF whilst I could at that. You can see here as well that my financial slice, especially before the ETFs, is a bit smaller than I'd like. I'd like to actually get my financials definitely north of 15%. So this is positively moving at 14.3 once I break it out from the ETFs. So, uh, yeah, that's really the big difference between these two here. This 22% slice in my ETF gets broken down and you can sort of see that some segments really grow very much, including technology, actually. Uh, but financials is one that grows a little bit as well. And then some of these smaller slices down here as well, including uh, non-discretionary and those sort of things. So we're keeping an eye on our sector, actually. So I'd like to, like technology, I'm reasonably happy with where we're at at the moment, although I wouldn't mind adding a bit more because it looks not too expensive. And financials is my next focus. Uh, we have had some dividends, actually, but I think I'm going to give you a look at my transaction history tab uh, and talk through it that way. So honestly, my quarter one for 2023 has been really good. A couple of sort of um, notable things within that. So yeah, so that's the overall direction of my portfolio and how it's currently doing at the moment. And if I go across the transactions, just because again, it's been a few weeks. <clears throat> In terms of my recent buys, you can see here that this is all um, dominated by both the US banks and uh, some Scottish mortgage as well. I also, like, there's a couple of other big buys here, like for Bowl, where I uh, got a very large dividend. We can have a look at the dividend as well. And likewise, with my real estate and Microsoft, this is just dividend reinvestment. But you can kind of see a lot of my bigger moves recently have been in uh, banks as well as SMT. And to a lesser degree, I have also been buying as well uh, my uh, S&P small cap, which is quite red at the moment, about 6% down. I uh, didn't time this one so well. Um, but again, I'm really happy to be have an opportunity to be averaging down on this as well, because I like these kind of sized companies that I get in this ETF as well. If I have a look at my dividends recently, so over the last few weeks, I think the last time we covered this, maybe I'd had the ASML one. But, you know, a couple of small ones here and then a couple of very big ones. So first of all, I think it's worth talking about Hollywood Bowl. So this is my this is a really strong conviction for me, actually. And I think right now the price is really good value. It's like two, three, five. For me, I have a price target here of 310, so I think it's significantly undervalued, honestly. It was a nice surprise for me because as well as the final dividend here of 8.53, they did a special dividend of 3p, which I'd kind of glossed over, even though it's very clear. Because their interim dividend, so their last one was also 3p, my brain just assumed that the 3p was like the previous dividend and didn't factor it in. Like as soon as I got this nice, pleasant surprise of a, of a special dividend, you know, an extra 3p, it was really positive. And basically their dividend policy is a 50% payout ratio where because they had performed so well in the second half of the year, they just gave an extra 3p to, to meet that objective. 
So that that's the, basically your your dividend growth here is going to grow in alignment with their earnings. Um, and for me, I think they're a really good little company. They're only like half a billion in terms of their market cap, so small, but a really well-run little business that I'm really confident on in the long term. So this went straight back in, even though I'm averaging up on Hollywood, I still consider it an absolute bargain. Games Workshop, unfortunately, I decided to not reinvest, and that's because it sits in outside of my ISA. So um, here my stake is now big enough that if I make it any bigger, it's going to incur tax for me. So I kind of have to keep it where it is. Uh, but I did reinvest it and basically transferred it into an ISA to buy into Scottish Mortgage, so that was fine too. And then just a couple of recent ones last week for uh, my real estate ETF as well as Microsoft. March, I do have like another £100 in uh, dividends to come, but with the exception of Amcor, which is about 30 the rest is literally right at the very end of the month. So sort of, you know, HBAN and uh, Huntsman. Uh, so yeah, so actually I think for March, a lot of that won't clear and it will land in April, but that's standard stuff for me and my broker. So that feels fine as well. And in terms of deposits, again, I have been um, adding some as I look to hit my um, my ISA maximums, basically. That's really the main reason for this very small deposit here, a 413, just to finish my personal ISA. And now I've just got my wife to do. Uh, but yeah, we, we've been adding sort of, you can see this year to date, we've been adding about 6K. So more or less what I'd expect to add over the last sort of two months, and then there'll be another 3K um, in March. So yeah, that, that's basically the run rate we need to do to hit 40 grand a year, uh, which is to maximize our, our ISIS is very important. And in terms of sales, I don't actually think I've had any sales. Again, I'm very happy with my portfolio. Um, sorry, I, I guess I've had some ETF sales. My last big sell was actually Kingfisher. You can see here, actually, I didn't get great value for it in hindsight because it's performed quite well since. It had a broker upgrade. Um, and so it's sitting a bit higher than that, but it was such a small position. And my general approach now, I think that when I add positions, I'm going to sort of force myself to sell out of some of my smaller positions. If I just go back to my portfolio dashboard, um, and here we go, you can see I've got quite a long tail, like things like Elixir.digital. I'd, I'd kind of like to sell dot digital. I'm just being a bit stubborn because I'm sort of 10% down, um, but I may well sell out of dot digital. The next time I um, do it, Elixir here, even though it's my smallest, I'm really confident about the company, so I don't necessarily want to sell it. Similar to Crichton's actually as well. And then I've got my, my Amazon. Um, a lot of my sort of tech companies are here. Again, that's all being channeled now into an ETF, so I may well sort of in time. I, I'm in no rush to sell these companies, but when they're green and I feel better about them in the future, I'm just going to consolidate them all into my Alliance Technology Trust, which is my big tech ETF. So I think that's going to be the direction of travel. Like I've got 42 positions, I think 40, yeah, 41 positions. And I'd like to get that at least under 40. So I think I'm going to force myself to do like a one in one out moving forward. Uh, but that's the general direction. So I did sell out Kingfisher for uh, a reasonable profit, actually. Like my buy was in the 240s. So I still made, uh, you know, over 10% in a few months. So that felt fine. Um, and that's the general direction of my portfolio. So hopefully that makes sense. Quite a long update because I realized it's been a few weeks. But without further ado, let's look at Genius. All right, so I went on to Genius's earnings call on Friday, and I have to say I thought it was really good. The market, especially initially, felt differently, and it crashed like 23%. From my perspective, it probably represented a buying opportunity. Certainly, the results were in line with my expectations and indeed the market's expectations. Genius over 2022 have really established themselves as reliable in terms of their target expectations and i've definitely been impressed since they had an investor day in january 22 with the professionalism that's basically uh, increasingly evident in this business so despite currency headwinds they still hit their targets there so without the currency headwinds it would have been the yellow but they still hit the blue uh, so broadly speaking positive the U.S. does remain loss making. Again, that is very much the expectation for them. They don't expect the U.S. to break even until 2024. Um, but U.S. revenue start, is starting to represent more and more revenue across the group. They do have a non-U.S. part of their business, which is has been profitable for many years. Less exciting, but again, still an important part of their business and is basically supporting this expansion. So they do expect those to be uh, cash flow positive from H2 um, in this year. So that's positive from that perspective as well. But the US specifically will not break even until 2024. 
Uh, yeah, so in terms of their margins, and I noticed in this uh, presentation was the first time really since the investor day that they highlighted the non-US stuff. Like Genius is all about the US hope, but again, there's already an established business here that I think often gets overlooked. And it's unfortunate really that Genius went through the SPAC process and probably was overvalued. Like I can now accept that I basically overpaid for this business. But despite that history, there is a good business, I'm, I'm convinced, uh, underneath this. And like for me, as I've spoken about before, I went on to the 2022 investor day willing to basically accept a big haircut and get out of the position but I liked what I saw um, and I continue to like what I saw like for me it's really pleasing that they're basically delivering on their their numbers as we'll go into in a bit more detail in just a second uh, I would also highlight as well that it's the first time that they've started to talk about that actually even though non-US markets are mature that because of the fact they've had like progression in their technology stack they now have cross-sell and upsell opportunities even to established markets. This was a real change of tone, I would say, from what I've been hearing for the last few quarters. And again, from my perspective, that should be positive, right? If they're able to take a profitable base uh, in those countries and um, you know leverage what they already have, then great. Also as well, they basically said that their run rate is so good and that their costs have started to reduce in 2023 and will especially reduce in 2024, that even without any significant wins in terms of additional markets, so where they operate, additional partners, so betting companies, um, sorry, sports streaming companies or operators, which are the betting companies, um, that they will basically make their 2023 targets. I would say if anything on the earnings call, and maybe this was some of the disappointment initially with the earnings, was that the investors sort of were underwhelmed with the fact that they stuck with their initial 2023 outlook that they'd previously given. They felt like, you know, there wasn't enough confidence to basically increase those expectations. So it'll be interesting to see what happens in 2023, like whether this is genius just sandbagging or being prudent or whether, again, like we should um, trust them in, in their business uh, projections, basically. So I thought this was uh, promising as well. They, they basically don't have to have any big wins in order to hit their, their 2023 targets. Also as well, like churn is very low. They have a 96% retention, but they specifically said that that's on a per customer basis and that almost all of their churn or almost no churn is basically related to successful businesses. It's basically very small operators who have fallen out of the market altogether. So that they said that with one exception, uh, they basically had uh, no material churn, which again is positive. I think in general, the way I view Genius is it's a very sticky product. So once you can get in the door, you basically are able to cross sell and upsell a lot of cool stuff to kind of bridges that, that big data, the gambling and the sports rights, right? To bring it to people. So we'll touch a bit more on that in just a moment. The cash position was really positive. They had a 140 to 150 expectation and comfortably exceeded that. They did set expectations that because of a number of rights uh, renewals in Q1 this year, that there'll be like a near $40 million hit. But from their perspective, that's the last major um, thing to call out. And again, because they're going to be cash flow positive in 2023 H2, uh, they're not expecting any further needs for uh, capital raise at all. They also pointed out, and I touched on this a fair few weeks ago now, that they basically called forward a lot of their rights issues to simplify the, the shareholder structure, which I think is a good thing in the long term. Basically means that almost all and the rest of it will um, crystallize this year. Almost all of their, their warrants and their rights issues are accounted for now in their share structure. So simplifying the ownership structure. And speaking of shares, it's definitely something which is increasingly prevalent at the moment in terms of stock based compensation. Genius is not alone in basically paying for a lot to build their technology stack. So it has been $90 million this year, that, as in 2022. They now expect that to be $20 million per year moving forward as a kind of relatively stable um, number. So that's uh, good news as well. It just means less dilution, right? And ultimately, now we should end up in a situation where the share count is uh, reasonably stable. Again, from my perspective, there's nothing wrong with share based compensation, but obviously you want it to not be too extreme and you also want it to uh, incentivize the right behaviors. Again, I think um, people like Joseph Carson have spoken about this plenty, but definitely stock based compensation can be abused in terms of how it's reported from a financial perspective, which is ugly uh, in my opinion as well. So <clears throat> I would summarize Genius's 22 results as basically delivering on what they said they were going to deliver. I thought it was really good. <clears throat> I still don't really understand the market's reactions. Uh, the share price did close down more realistically compared to the wider market, considering, again, this is a growth tech stock and it published the results at the same time as uh, Silicon Valley was doing its thing. Um, <clears throat> but broadly speaking, I think the results were a huge overreaction 
and that there's probably a buying opportunity if you view Genius as the same uh, that I do. In terms of moving forward now, I wanna um, spend a bit more time looking at a bit more detail on the numbers, so let's do that now. So first of all, the top right here, these are the 2022 actuals now. So when they talk about 25 uh, financial targets, really it's kind of five down and five across. You can see here though that sort of uh, 10 of them are basically just totals or what's above. So it's a little bit of a exaggeration to say there are 25 individual targets because ultimately they just feed up into the to what's above, right? Really here you could look at this as almost being 12 targets, right? It's three different business areas across four quarters. Uh, so fine, if that's the way they want to talk about it. They are pains to point out that basically they hit every single one. There are a couple of green asterisks here. This basically means that they hit it once you take into account FX movements. But broadly, again, I still think overall the important ones here are that they hit these two uh, without the asterisk. Uh, that's that's good, right? Um, in terms of 2023, again, there was some disappointment that these weren't more ambitious, especially after Genius sort of you know gave the uh, summary that they don't need any big wins uh, in order to hit these numbers. I, I think it was sort of seen as a little bit too pessimistic. Uh, in terms of their journey. Um, like, I think the other thing that's happened this year with Genius is, you know, they've defended their their business model a few times in court, right, and have basically forced companies who are using their data to enter into a commercial agreement with them. So that kind of proves the, the business model. They've also expanded um, quite a lot. They have the land and expand um, approach that I see quite often in earnings calls. Um, but they're doing it quite successfully. You know, they'll basically get into uh, a relationship with, say, the NFL, and then they'll expand it, um, which is, you know, again, a good example of upsell and cross-sell. Um, and likewise, the um, we're starting to see more of that as well. So <clears throat> I kind of shared a little bit, I suppose, in the investors, uh, sorry, the analyst disappointment that 2023 wasn't upgraded. And we will basically see uh, how the year materializes uh, in terms of that. From their point of view, as well as my opinion, uh, many of the heavier investments are now behind them. They've you know, got the sports rights, basically. They've built a lot of the technology stack. They expect their um, CapEx, which includes you know, R&D and basically internal development to be about 40 million this year, which was the same as last year. And then they expect it to materially reduce from 2024 was their uh, wording. So again, 2024 is gonna be such a huge year because basically cost reduce, revenue should increase and you should end up with a really sweet looking business from 2024. So you have to kind of bear that time horizon in mind but again there's there's a good little business emerging here in my opinion uh they also again because this was slightly less u.s centered um they did speak about other markets so to start with the u.s you still have additional states uh, but brazil was also mentioned as well they see big opportunity in brazil they're one of the companies that's been invited to basically go on to a sports integrity board which is i think a good opportunity for them um, they already have similar kind of betting agreements with, uh, you know, and betting and then um, integrity of the betting agreements with the NFL. That was one of the upsells that they did this year. So I think it puts them in a good spot if Brazilian soccer football um, is, um, you know, going to be a growth area. Then that's going to be something where they'll be able to bring that professionalism to the market. They basically use data to uh, analyze uh, unusual sports betting uh, and, and identify from that perspective. So a good example here of where data is being used to improve kind of both the betting as well as the, <clears throat> you know, the the, the owner rights of uh, the sports franchises, etc. So that to me is exciting. Obviously, Brazil, a, a massive market um, and a, a good opportunity as well. They did flag specifically that that's more going to be 2024, but they are kind of getting up and running, expecting that to be an opportunity uh, in the, the medium term, let's say. I thought this was probably the most groundbreaking thing, actually, in the earnings school. Um, and I think it's potentially huge, depending on exactly what happens. So first of all, they start to talk about Dragon, which I'd never heard of before. And then there was a reason why it did get talked about. But basically, Dragon is their new platform that they are incredibly excited about. And from their perspective, they view it as game changing. <clears throat> Effectively, what Dragon is, is just a kind of upgrade on what they already have, but they think it's extremely powerful because of the data that it creates and the fact that they own the data. So it puts them in charge of the, the data and puts them in a near enough monopolistic position. Like they think they have the best data collection. You know, basically, it's going to be a requirement for dealing with Genius that you have to buy their data. Uh, you know, if you want to um, go onto their sports books and <clears throat> basically get access to it so that you can make smarter gambling decisions as, as a gambling uh, company and also so that you can um, give customers basically more customized abilities to watch so 
I mean, they started to link it into machine learning and AI more generally. That seems like a bit of a push, to be honest with you. Effectively, the way that it works is it learns over time how you as a viewer like to consume your content, whether that's just for watching or whether it's for placing bets as well, right? So the idea here is to basically customize viewers' uh, enjoyment. So rather than just, you know, the same stream being beamed to maybe 100 million people for, you know, the NFL Super Bowl, it's instead got, you know, thousands of different versions that you can watch and you know that you can call up data on etc uh, etc et and their argument is basically by having such additional data you empower the viewers to both get a better experience from watching it ultimately making the sports more enjoyable and therefore you know if you're a, a, an owner of the sports franchise then that's beneficial for you uh, and likewise for the gaming companies as well and this is where i think it's worth talking about their parlay bets so one of the revenue streams for genius is basically that they take a small um or basically a commission from each bet and they're saying one of the reasons why their revenues performed particularly strongly this year is that they get a one to two percent um revenue of each bet size so what people have been doing is basically doing more parlay bets so basically cumulative uh, bets both in game and before game and that's been very profitable for them as well as the the gambling companies themselves who make more money apparently from parlay bets which i think kind of makes sense because you know like as an individual you're chasing the big win but that's not that's going to be much rarer right you you might win two of your three bets but unless you win the third bet you get nothing so there's more chances for you to lose uh, your overall bet so i think it kind of makes sense from a mass perspective and it was the first time that they've again called this out basically that there have been changes in betting patterns as a result of they would argue of their technology so they they promised more of a demonstration on dragon at their investor day uh, next week so as soon as i see the details of that i might talk about it depending on whether i think it's been oversold or whether it really is as game changing as they think it is um, but I, I kind of see the rationale basically again they, they've successfully defended their data ownership over the last year and so if they're able to collate more data and that data is then providing useful insights that definitely has a commercial value like 100 percent. that's a very easy uh business case for me to get my head around so again the only disappointment here really is that the 2023 looks maybe a tad um pessimistic considering all the groundwork that's been laid but from my perspective again this is a company that deserves its um its 2022 success as i would see it's basically delivered on what it told the market it would deliver and so I actually was very happy with the results. For 2023, this is what they've committed to. And for 2024, we should see a profitable business. And that's the assumption that I'm gonna be working to until I hear otherwise. So again, this is now my third largest position. It really matters. Um, and potentially a lot of upside as well as a lot of downside. This is a very risky uh, position, right? Not too long ago was this a SPAC and I still am sitting on a sort of 35% uh, unrealized loss at the moment. So. Uh, we will see. Like I say, I accept that I overpaid for this, but I also don't think I'm being stubborn in holding it. This is my one SPAC or X SPAC that I decided to keep. I did take haircuts on several other companies, and I, but I think this company is a good company with a good future ahead of it. So, yeah, I liked the earnings. Like I say, we'll see what happens with Dragon um, and we will go from there. So I just wanted to bring you that. We will get to the Amcor and Huns of the world in due course, but we are catching up. But hopefully this was useful anyway. Check out the company. Do you agree or disagree? And any other comments, always welcome. Thanks very much for watching, everyone. I've been the Boss Hog, and good luck with your investing. Bye for now.